box and jump rope with them chinchilla shorts worth trump notes it's fantastic the boy out of grand rapid and never since a young teen he had the hands master to be perfect we all know it take practice who else dominated four different weight classes nobody they all got sloppy with it on top of that pretty floyd real cocky with it there's pb and pb two champs together church The steady rhythm in a rapper's prose and in a boxing gym are the music to Floyd Mayweather Jr.'s persona. Inside the ring, poetry explodes off his gloves. Exclamation point for the most agile mouth since the Louisville lip. You know, party every day since his fight. If the soul of a champion is made up of unequal parts of confidence, competitiveness, composure, and focus, Pretty Boy Floyd, the undefeated pound-for-pound -pound boxing king, oozes complete confidence. But is it authentic or part of his mind game? befuddling opponents and misleading those searching for the soul inside. We seek to discover his soul. Once I enter the ring, there's no fighter that can match me mentally. My goal is to be the best ever, and I think I'm the best fighter ever. Floyd Mayweather promised he would humiliate Arturo Gatti before his fans. I beat everybody you put in front of me. I'm going to continue to beat everybody you put in front of me. This sport is it's like no other sport. In, in the boxing, this is combat, this is war. Exhibiting the fruits of supreme confidence, Mayweather has dominated his divisions since beginning his pro career in 1996. His roots pointed to little else. With a father and two uncles in the fight game, his calling seemed preordained. But Mayweather Jr. has evolved beyond family ties, sporting an unblemished 36-0 career mark. Getting there obviously is hard, but you know, to be on top after 10 years, it's just, it's unbelievable. He's been a world champion in four different weight classes. What drives him to obsession is a passion for others to acknowledge his superiority. You gotta know your distance. You got you got to know your distance. You gotta know it. He believed when his era was gone, they're gonna rate him as the greatest fighter ever. Dedication, it's hard work. Dedication, it's hard work. Dad was his hero. He was really his hero. Dad took him to the gym every day and had to hold him up to hit the bag. Believe it or not, I started training my son when he was a baby, right in the crib. I took his hands and started doing that. Pretty soon, my son started doing that on his own. I couldn't believe it. I used to go to the gym and, you know, stand on the chair and hit the speed bag. And, you know, after hitting the speed bag for a few years, I got good at it. So when I was four years old, I know how to hit the speed bag like a, like a professional. When he came up here and he was uh, two and a half, three years old, he already would run his mouth a little bit, you know, and if you tell him to do something, he'd just run right back at you. And, um, and as he grew older, that trash talking got better and better and better. When well, there's another athlete that can go a decade without an L, then talk to me. One of the things that he likes to do when he's training is talk about the opponent that's coming up. How many, how many losses does that guy have? I ain't no shit, L. Basically, he's psyching himself as he's training. He's thinking about this other guy and putting this other guy down in his mind. There are some athletes that feel like their ability to think, maybe even psych out competitors, is a real advantage. I mean, you just think of Tiger Woods wearing red on Sundays. On May 22, 2004, Floyd Mayweather Jr. fought for the first time at the 140-pound weight class. His weapons in the ring that night, superior speed and accuracy, and a daring verbal counterattack. He started boxing me and started talking to me, getting me out of my game. He said, come on, fight me, fight me. Self-confidence is an athlete's belief in their ability to execute in the present moment. He has that utmost confidence and belief in his ability. Now. The general public or fans see that as cocky. He sees it as confidence. It's not a crime to boast about your talent. All he boasts about is talent. So it's not a crime to boast about your talent. No, you can prove him wrong. Everything I talked about, if you call it bragging or boasting, whatever you want to call it, I lived up to it. These boys coming to the gym, they work out every day. 
Every day. You know, you start trash talking to them and, and uh, you know, just trying to put them down a little bit to make himself feel up here where he, where he thought he should be. And that would overcome maybe any fear that he had. The fear of failure, it has to be there for any top echelon athlete. And uh, if it is a fear, I would think it's the fear of losing the stature that he has. Any great basketball player that's out there right now had a lot of great, a lot of great nights. They had a, also had a lot of bad nights, but still is known as, as a great player. And this sport is different. You know, you lose, you lose your number one spot. The elf said with you the rest of your career. Fear. All at once, it is an athlete's paradox. Either the catalyst for success or the tripwire for failure. Boxing, if you're losing, I might want to lose. Who want to lose? I mean, you lose, that means you like everybody else. A lot of these kids feel that when they lose their O, they're losing so much of themselves, and that's unfortunate because then they don't take chances, like Mayweather, who's, you know, ducked uh, Antonio Margarito because Margarito's a dangerous fight, and Mayweather doesn't want to lose the O. The zero means a lot to any person in sports, not just him. Nobody will have a loss at nothing. So that fear thing saying to you, uh, man, whole world watching me. You know, I'm on a world stage. USA Today, Soul of a Champion, every Tuesday in you. You're watching Soul of a Champion on Versus. Well, my goal in life is I know which I know is going to happen. I'm going to retire the best fighter ever. His sole motivation is that he wants to retire undefeated. Being a multiple champion, in five, six different weight classes and go down as um, the best ever to do it. In the steely environment of Grand Rapids, Michigan, a father convinced his son of the riches that live beyond the city limits. Through boxing, Floyd Sr. instilled dreams of fame and wealth to young Floyd. His father was somewhat of a hero around the general area here, so he looked up to his father. He knew his father was something, and he wanted to be like that. Fame got all of us. If we can get some, I don't care if we get a, a two-minute shot in the paper. You'll tell your friend, oh, I'm, a, I'm in the paper over there. So fame by was to a certain degree. Boxing was a vehicle by which he did it. Uh, but he, he had a strong desire to be a success and be well-known. The son looked at Dad's career, a 36-1 and one mark as a professional, including a 1978 fight versus Sugar Ray Leonard as a benchmark. But in 1993, while Junior was in the Golden Glove circuit, his dad was convicted of cocaine trafficking and sent to prison for four and a half years. The sudden departure detoured dad's life and warped the focus of his prodigy. That was a really bad moment for me. It was, it was hurting me bad inside, man. I couldn't be there for my son. He was kind of looked down because him and dad did everything together. They used to run um, by the five or, about 10 miles a day. They did everything together. He wanted to be a boxer, but after his father, you know, went to prison, he was like, you know, I don't really know what to do. He got sort of depressed and just didn't come around for a while. I think that he was struggling with his focus. I talked to him frequently on the phone. You know, I, I would bring some things back to him, you know, that was written down about boxing and. You know, I would refresh in his mind sometimes. They would say, oh, daddy, oh, daddy, you right. I, I remember that. With his incarcerated dad unable to attend, Floyd Jr. entered the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. As a favorite in the featherweight division, he was stunned with a judge's decision in the semifinal round and settled for the bronze. The controversy offered another opportunity for fight or flight. It was the avenue out for him. And of course, he really would have won them, but they robbed him. They took that fight from him. And he cried. Not around nobody. I never want to let nobody see me cry. Because it, it really, really hurt me. Because I really wanted to, you know, bring the medal back home. Are they like, oh, he won a bronze medal Olympics. Oh, he won a silver. No. You lose gold, you, re you receive silver, and you receive bronze. I'm glad I got the bronze. Because a true champion can take a loss and bounce back. And I feel that was, a, that was, that was my loss. That was just a way God telling me I need to work harder. So when I got on that plane and left Atlanta, 
I left it right behind. And once I get in here, I go in the zone. And when I go in the zone, can't nobody stop me. You know, every time I used to fight, they always talk about, you know, what my dad been through and what I've been through. And, you know, a lot of, try, a lot of times I try to get in my head, but there's none that can, that can get to me. Mayweather, intent on forging his own path, has taken the direct road in both his career and training methods. But within Mayweather's focus is the inherent tendency to align himself with only those who agree with his methods. Relationships fall victim to the ultimate motives. From 93 to 98, I'm standing on my own two feet. So, you know, when my dad get out, he, I guess he still think I'm still a young boy. But, you know, I tell him, you know, I'm my own man. I'm grown now. I've been on my own for five years. You know, as a man, we just see things eye to eye. So he went his way and I went my way. I'm the one that got him everything he got. Everything he got, I got it. Everything he giving people, I did it for him. His daddy did it for him. My dad had me running them boots. He had me chopping wood. But, you know, you get grown, you want to do things your way. I want to run in tennis shoes. If a dad is just, you know, screaming at you, you know, you start not to hear it. And I think as Floyd became older and became a man himself, I think he came to resent that and resist that a little bit. Pretty much that's, that's the genesis of uh, their split. He's going to be the best in the world, and he is. And he, and he is because of his daddy, not nobody else. Let's get that, let's get that clear. Roger Mayweather, Jr.'s uncle, has trained the champ for the last seven years. Floyd Sr. works his own fighters. The only communication between them is through the media. As a father seeks credit for a soul he once captivated, but no longer recognizes. Back then, that's the sound I know. This person here now, I don't know. How can a man walk in a, a room and see your daddy and don't acknowledge him? And your daddy is the only way you ever got where you got. Your daddy, not nobody else. I think uh, boxing is harder than any other sport. Once you get in there and it's just you and the other guy, it's tough. You take any, any athlete from any other sport, and they won't last a round. One round. Our athlete was, wouldn't last one round. In the gladiator world of boxing, Mayweather embraces the inherent sacrifice. In 2002, a freak training accident just days before his lightweight title match against Jose Luis Castillo tested his competitiveness. I was close to the back when I hit the back, my arm. I was too close, threw a punch like this, and my arm bent back like this, which, uh, you know, tore the, uh, the, the, the rotator cuff. My arm was killing me, it was hurting so bad. It was like one of the worst feelings I ever had. I come to his house early Saturday morning, the day of the fight, and I come into his room, and all I could smell was a bunch of being gay. And I'm saying to myself, we're getting ready to fight, a major fight, what the hell is going on? I didn't want to let nobody know. And, I'm, and I said, yo, I'm going to fight because this, this opportunity may never come again in life. Mayweather made a comment in the corner about his left shoulder. We'll see if it is something wrong with it. Confidence feeds trust. The more confident you are, the easier it is to trust your body and go out there and do what you're trained to do. Mayweather's leaping in with the strong left hook. He wanted to go out there and be able to still perform and show that he could beat this guy basically with one arm. The winner by unanimous decision, Pretty Boy, Floyd Mayweather. Losing? He wouldn't even go there. He doesn't even want to fathom that. He doesn't even want to put that thought or that word in his mind. Mayweather's exaggerated competitiveness and drive for an eternal legacy has flowered into a self-governing style and dictated a 24-hour on-call approach to training. Some days he'll come in the gym and he'll get he'll get a little frustrated at Roger because Roger won't allow him to go, you know, the rounds that he wants to, to go. I've been around the great ones. I mean, I've seen the Sugar Ray Leonard's train, the Larry Holmes, the Mike Tysons. I've never, never seen a fighter train like him. He a freak to train. He loves to train. If he's anywhere, if he's anywhere, it'd be a restaurant, it could be a nightclub, he get up, he get up and start running. Other fighters got a, they got a regiment, they got a schedule, and that's not me. I stay up late. I run with Timberlands on, jeans on, I mean, t-shirt, whatever I got on, I run. If I feel like running, I'm gonna go out and run. 
you never know when Floyd is ready to work. I mean, you can leave the house and go to the party. After the party, keep going to the trunk, flip on some shoes, and just start running. You be like, we just left the club. And you be like, go run. We just ate. Come on, man, we got to work. You know, he's calling me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Come on, L, where you at? Come on, let's go. You know, you late. Let's go. I'll say to him, Floyd, we're going to run five miles. We get, we get to the five mile point. And he'll take off running. There's nothing I can do, you know, and he'll run an extra three miles. When he's training in the middle of the night, what are most other fighters doing? They're sleeping, you know, so that gives him that, that psychological edge. When he's working, most fighters are sleeping. How does your soul compare to Floyd's? He took the soul of a champion test, and you can too. Just log on to Versus.com and take our 20-question test. I'm just blessed. I don't know why God chose me, what he chose me. I always ask myself, but why you chose me? I'm happy it was me that was chosen. I don't believe in religion. Because a person is a Christian, a person is a Catholic, a person is a Muslim, a person is a Jew. I feel under God, I, we all are one. So I find myself praying all day, all day. I pray every day and all day. Don't nobody know it. That's one of my secrets. And I told you. <laughs> gives him faith that someone's looking over him. And when he feels like someone's looking over him and taking care of him, that gives him that added little confidence. Filled with a spiritual sense of humility, Mayweather has faced, then thrived, in the vice of public attention. Composure is a byproduct of his complete preparation. If you get a ball in Michael Jordan, you know he's going to take the last shot, right? He gonna take it whether he make it or miss it. But 90% of the time, he's gonna make it. You know why? Because that pressure has been put on him all the time. It get to a point where you understand pressure and you know how to deal with it. And I think that's what he does. I never let what's going on on the outside affect what's going on in the inside because I know this is my job and, and this paid the way for me. And the county crowd responds. When I went to Atlantic City, and all the fans are in there rooting for Gotti. That means it's a great feeling. I feel good because I know once once we get in that, uh, that square circle, I, what I really, really know in my heart, the fans cannot get in there and fight for a fight. It's just me and him, one on one. Mayweather knocked him halfway across the ring with his own business left. And I always remind him, this ain't nothing but the gym. That means he can focus just like it is the gym. When the gym, there's no woo, no ah, uh, oh, uh, oh man, he did this, oh, he did it. It ain't none of that. It's just you, me, and him, and the guys he boxing. As Mayweather enters the latter half of his career, he faces the age-old mental struggle, the need to be noticed and to establish a legacy versus the dangers inherent in losing a fight and his identity. With all due respect to Floyd, we haven't seen Floyd in trouble. And until he's in trouble and works his way out of trouble and shows the heart of a champion, right, the, the jury has to be out. If he suffered a loss by some chance, it very well could uh, damage his psyche to some degree. But we'll have to wait and see that because it hasn't happened yet, and I don't see it happening in the immediate future. You don't necessarily have to beat, a, beat an opponent all the time with your fists as a boxer. You can beat him with your mind, or you can beat him with strategy, or you can beat him with maybe something you said going into the fight. Floyd Mayweather Jr. is a very cerebral fighter, so uh, psychology is part of his repertoire. He's the epitome of what being the soul of a champion is all about, because his work ethic is unbelievable, his dedication, and his belief in himself. But I believe that when all is said and done, they went for it along with Sheila Robinson, along as one of the greatest fighters ever to put on a pair of gloves. And I think that would represent the soul of a champion. I'm 100% sure I'm the best fighter in the world. And I told you that, and I mean, I'm for sure about that. And somebody else tell you different, they must not be in a fight game. <laughs>